Hello everyone, I'm Hunter Hicks. Today we're going to be talking about sleep apnea, both central and obstructive. So when we look at sleep apnea, um, as far as epidemiology, we know it's uh, going to be both in males and females, a little bit more common in males. Um, and in males, uh, there is some some correlation with older males, uh, as the older you get, the higher your risk goes, but that um, research is um, still kind of ongoing, I guess. Um, it's not super strong. But in general, we know it's um, more common in males, and that might just be because males have a uh, weaker pharynx muscles, and they're just more prone to that um, closure happening or obstruction when we talk about obstructive sleep apnea. As far as females, we do know that females that are postmenopausal have lower levels of oxytocin, which oxytocin is a natural stimulator for the diaphragm, so it causes those respirations in females. So postmenopausal females that lose that um, have a high, higher risk for the apnea in general. Um, some other big risk factors, we know obesity is one of the bigger risk factors, and we'll kind of show why that is, where the fat kind of likes to sit. Um, but other just um, uh, anatomy problems, right? Larger tonsils, sometimes a, a really small uh, jaw line, jawline, a really small jaw in general can put them, because it moves everything posterior, it puts them at higher risk for obstruction here as well. Um, when we look at some of the comorbidities with these patients that they can develop from obstructive sleep apnea, things like AFib, especially with coronary artery disease, studies have shown that by treating the obstructive sleep apnea or the sleep apnea, patients actually uh, do better with their AFib or it actually treats the AFib, which is pretty amazing. Um, other things like systemic hypertension, which might just come from constant sympathetic arousal of these patients when they're waking up, and also in general, um, just the, the, the sheer stress on the vessels from this. Um, pulmonary hypertension can just come from um, constant remodeling of these pulmonary vasculature from the hypoxemia and the shunting that we know that's happening. One of the biggest things though your patients will have is hyperenzymia. So that's not that they're just fatigued or kind of sleepy. They're falling asleep during non-stimulating events and that could be driving, watching TV, talking to someone if it's a non-stimulating conversation. In general, these patients are just falling asleep throughout the day and they'll tell you that they're super tired. Now my definition, sleep apnea is apneic uh, phases of a breath longer than 10 seconds for usually greater than five times in an hour, but it can happen way more than that. Some patients can have apneic events up to 600, 800 times in an entire uh, sleep cycle of six to eight hours. And again, they don't usually know they're having this, the patient themselves, so that's why they wake up so tired and they have no idea why. Uh, quick add, uh, yes, this is definitely in adults, but we can have it in kids. It's pretty common if they have very large tonsils, which is causing the obstruction, um, and even some obesity in our, in our younger, um, patient population. So when we look at obstruction, really the area that we're talking about is air is going to come through the nasopharynx and then the oropharynx. And the area that we're talking about is really the pharynx, um, where we're getting that obstruction. So what I circled here really is the soft palate and the tongue are going to kind of fall back and obstruct the pharynx area, which is going to cause the airflow not to happen and obviously cause the arousal. So we're going to say why they wake up and we're going to talk about that here in a minute, but that's one of the biggest reasons is that these, these areas here just kind of fall back in the throat and then they don't let the air pass through. Now, as you can see, like if someone's drinking alcohol or if they have sedatives on board, that can cause all this area here to relax and fall back. That's why we have to be careful as providers because patients that come in with uh, insomnia, we know we sometimes, uh, there's a lot of things that get prescribed, but things like benzos or benzo-like drugs like Ambien or Lunesta or um, those things that cause relaxation of these muscles might actually make this obstructive sleep apnea worse. We got to be very careful with that in general. Now, another reason this might happen is we know when our patients breathe on non-invasively just breathing, they're going to pull air and that's going to create a negative pressure, right? Because we're going to drop the diaphragm, pull air in, and that naturally wants to make our uh, pharynx or our throat kind of close off. But we have something called the dilator muscle that you can see here with the blue arrow that naturally tries to keep everything open. So if patients just have a weak dilator muscle, it might put them at higher risk for obstructive sleep apnea. Now, the other thing, too, as you can see, is like I don't really obese patients. Some of that fat loves to just deposit here in the pharyngeal walls, right? So now we even have more of obstruction, right? We have even less of a diameter here, which puts us at higher risk, too, within our obesity patients. Central sleep apnea, far less common than obstructive, only about 10% of the cases, but it's also very common for patients to have both, and we have mixed 
uh, sleep apnea. Now, central sleep apnea, not so much, obviously, again, is the obstruction. It's really just the actual diaphragm or the respiratory center isn't working, right? So we know the respiratory center found in the medulla talks to our diaphragm through our phrenic nerve, but something is going on here. Now, this could be patients that maybe had a stroke, patients that have disease of the brain, like encephalitis, um, other things like uh, we know breathing patterns that can cause apnea, like Shane Stokes. Well, Shane Stokes is a type of breathing pattern with apnea-like um, pauses in there, which we can see with TBI patients or even our congestive heart failure patients. We have that nice crescendo, decrescendo, and then periods of apnea, CO2 goes up and restarts the process. So um, definitely other causes of central sleep apnea um, out there, but again, these patients don't have the obstructive cause. So how this works, why do our patients wake up? Well, we know when we breathe, if you imagine you're looking at a capnography waveform right now, we breathe, we create tidal volume, and we know tidal volume times our respiratory rate is our minimum ventilation, and that's how we create or how we expel CO2. So when we breathe, CO2 goes down, we pull in partial pressure of oxygen, which we know is around 21%. We bring it in, CO2 and oxygen go through diffusion at the alveolar capillary membrane. Well, when we're not breathing, our CO2 stacks up, oxygen cause comes down, that works on the phrenic nerves. We know we have our central chemoreceptors. Sorry, not phrenic nerves, our chemoreceptors. We know we have our central chemoreceptors and our peripheral chemoreceptors. And in our peripheral chemoreceptors, they're more concerned about the hypoxemia and our central is gonna be more concerned with hypercarbia. Either way, one of those guys gets um, upset and it tells the diaphragm move and create some um, respirations to happen. That's what wakes our patient up. They wake up, um, we get some, um, uh, arousal back in the upper airway so that obstruction usually goes away or the diaphragm starts moving we create some air and then your patient falls back asleep again usually they have no idea that they're having these arousal moments throughout the night and they can have multiple throughout the night and that's why when we look at our subjective and objective data it's very very good to sometimes ask their partner or someone they're living with or sleeping with do they notice any of these apneic-like events. Other subjective things that our patients can complain about, like I said, this uh, hyper uh, uh, insomnia. They're just, they're tired. They're, they're really tired, hypersomnolent, sorry. They're super, super tired. Not just like I feel kind of fatigued because I didn't sleep last night because I'm stressed out, but they are so tired, like they need to pull over during a long car ride and sleep for like three to four hours, or they're watching TV and then they fall asleep, whatever it might be, okay? They might also wake up with a headache, and that's because CO2 is a potent vasodilator in the cerebral vasculature, right? So it's gonna dilate those arteries and those veins. It's gonna cause a lot of pain once they start breathing, they get the CO2 off. That, headache will usually go away. Um, objective things, obviously a very big neck or like a large collar size, that's a huge indicator for obstructive sleep apnea. They could have uh, hypertension, they could have atrial fibrillation, all these things, any anatomy things you notice, right? Large tongue, big tonsils, any issues here with the mandible, all those things can be objective and subjective data that we are looking at to help diagnose these patients. But when we talk about diagnosis, we have the Stanford Sleepiness Scale and the Epworth Sleepiness Scale. And both of these sleep, uh, scales look at um, how sleepy patients are during the day or how likely they are to fall asleep during um, non-simulating times of the day. They take a score and see how likely it is. But the biggest thing is bringing them into a lab for this polysomnogram and in general, bringing them into the lab, watching them sleep. It's very expensive and cannot be done at home. There are some things that can be done at home, but they're not usually super specific. Treatment, uh, in general, we can have our patients lose weight. That might help if they do have an obesity. And sometimes sleeping on their side or sleeping upright might help out a little bit. Biggest thing is CPAP, which we know is a constant pressure. CPAP, same as EPAP when you're talking ventilation or, e or um, EPAP. Keeps this constant flow, keeps that open so they move air in and out. Now, nasal CPAP or the whole face, either one. Um, nasal CPAPs can be more common uh, to be seen, and it helps out a lot. It can even help out with some central sleep apnea. The biggest thing is why don't we use this on everyone if it works? Well, patients tend to not want to wear it because it keeps them uh, up at night sometimes or keeps their partner up at night usually, and it dries them out. Surgeries that can be done, tonsils, anything to help up the obstruction in general. Ultimately, a trach is like super severe if they have a cardiac dysrhythmias that are really bad. And that obviously will totally by, um, bypass this whole pharynx area up here.